Um, I suppose I want to start actually. It's been a brilliant introduction this morning because the first two speakers have discussed about the benefits of the community, doing community archaeology, which is something that many of us as archaeologists engage with without even knowing we're doing it. It's that communication with people. And this really is where this research springs from. I've been doing public community archaeology since I started doing archaeology when I was seven years old. My love for archaeology sprang from its benefits individually, personally. I was a little girl who couldn't read, couldn't write, had some bullying issues and struggled. And archaeology was my way to feel that I was good at something. I went on my first dig. It was the best experience I ever had. And from then on, I realised to myself, but actually potentially to other people, what it could do socially, what it could do for me and my well-being. Didn't know at that point. Um, and so I've kind of spent the rest of my time becoming an archaeologist, training to dig properly, um, but actually more importantly, trying to figure out why archaeology has such an impact on people, how it can change people, but what positives we can bring. And I've been incredibly lucky. I've been incredibly lucky to be a community archaeologist, to work all over the place, running community projects with the communities. But now I'm incredibly lucky that I get to do that, but also I get to research about actually how it's beneficial. So in this talk, I want to discuss with you about kind of a larger research project I was involved in and whether archaeology can make you happy, whether it can improve well-being, and specifically whether digging holes in the ground, excavation, can make you happy. Now, in many senses, this research sprung from researching about the social values, hearing people tell you that, you know, oh, this helped me make friends, this, uh, helped me feel that I could engage with my local community. This gave me a sense of place. All those kind of acronyms that also like to be used, but it sprung from trying to understand the social values. But it also sprung from wanting to prove to the powers that be, to the funders, to various people, that archaeology had a place in wider value, wider impact that people were beginning to talk about well-being and happiness on a wider scale. We were beginning to talk about gross national happiness. We are hearing politicians espousing the social benefits of various other forms of engagement and public activity. But archaeology wasn't really being considered. And as we all know probably in here, archaeology does have potential. We're just awfully bad sometimes at doing the work to prove it is valuable. And we need to be doing more of that. We need to be proving, and I mean quantitatively and qualitatively, the value we have. So I started a project in which my plan was to investigate as many archaeological excavation projects that involve community as I could in a kind of relatively short space of time. I'll talk to you a little bit more about those projects in a bit. And then eventually develop my own project to test out some of these theories. So, I built the research on the New Economic Foundation's Roots to Happiness. And they suggested that if people could connect, so with people around them, make friends within the community, if they could be active, so they can engage in a physical activity, they could take notice, be curious about the world around them, they could learn, so knowledge, but also try something new, feel confidence, they kept mentioning. But they could also give and volunteer their time. This would make people happier. Now, all these seem to correlate quite heavily with what archaeology did, with what, what archaeology could do, and my experience of archaeological excavations. These were start part of the key points of an archaeological excavation and things that could happen. So, based on, and I would like to say, these are not my methods. These are methods I have purloined, adapted from uh, 
health accredited measures, but also measures that have already been tested for testing well-being and happiness. So they involve PANAS, which is a positive and <coughs> negative effect schedule, and the visual analogue scale. I basically implemented these two mechanisms for testing well-being on a range of heritage case studies. I'm going to talk to you more about exactly what those methods entailed in a minute. But the criteria for choosing case studies, because what I wanted to do, I wanted to choose archaeological excavations that included the community, but I also wanted to make sure it was quite a diverse range of excavations. But I set up a criteria for choosing case studies, and it involved participation. So people had to be able to participate in a range of excavation processes, um, and it had to be open, open to the public. They had to provide research and training elements, so to develop new skills. They had to um, have a diverse range of projects, so student training, community, mixed methods, residential, non-residential, in a range of contexts, so there was UK context, but actually also I did some projects in America, and over a range of periods. Because, let's face it, the finds you find could affect if you enjoy the project. And over a range of time periods, because I wanted this to be a longitudinal study, so I wanted this study to investigate not only how people felt in the moment, but how they felt before the project, during the project, and after the project, and whether we could see changes. And that really was critical to this study. So six case studies were chosen. Um, a total of 210 individuals were sampled. Um, of those, after taking away, if one of the samples was missing, so if a middle week sample was missing, if they didn't complete the three range of surveys, they were excluded because I needed the longitudinal evidence. We got roughly 100 individuals engaged with total survey results. So what we did... Well, the evaluation involved two questionnaires, bluntly putting it, which were self-undertaken. So they did it themselves. They were given a modified visual analogue scale. So that is a ranking from 1 to 10, and they have to answer these questions and give a ranking from 1 to 10. So the questions were based on the New Economic Foundation questions. So think about yourself, how interested are you in the world around you? Thinking about your own life, how do you connected do you feel to the people around you? Considering your personal happiness, how happy are you at the moment? And thinking about your own life and per personal circumstances, how satisfied are you? And this was the basis for understanding personal well-being. So say people gave me a score of 10 for everything. I'd assume they're incredibly happy, content individuals who needed nothing more doing with their lives. Um, but say they gave me a score of 10 at the beginning and a score of zero at the end, I probably would assume that archaeology was making them pretty miserable. Just a guess. Um, and that's how the scoring was based. Simple way of putting it. Then the other survey was the positive ne and negative effects scale. Now, this scale involved them ranking the words from one to five. So, five would be, I feel very attentive on your positive words. Uh, if you did five for negative words, you'd be very distressed. So, they had po we had positive and negative words. And people had to give them a number from one to five. Um, I'd like to just point out with this survey, this only works with adults above the age of 18. Um, it's quite emotionally complex, so this is a more difficult survey to undertake and something that people can struggle with. Um, because it's a highly emotive survey as well, and it's, it involves a degree of emotional intelligence. And I'd like to say that not all 18-year-olds have that either, or 30-year-olds, or 60-year-olds. Um, so it can be more problematic. But if someone was to score, give me ones for all the positives, 
I would assume they were not very happy and their well-being was pretty low. If I was someone to give me fives for all my negative words, I'd assume people were pretty miserable as well. Other way round, lots of highs for positive words, lots of lows for negative words, they're happy people. Simple way, but it's kind of how it works. So getting to the nitty gritty, because this is really what we want to know. Can it make you happy? Can digging make you happy? I'm going to show you horrible graphs, and I'm sorry, because that's one of the only ways I can do this, and I've tried to simplify it. So I have simplified it in a way, I've joined them all together. I haven't included all the rubbish statistical analysis that I also had to do, um, which was rather painful, and involved things like paired sample testing and hurt my brain a lot. These results show us two things. These are the visual analogue scale results. So as I suggested, if they have low scores, so the, the orange is the beginning scores, the scores before they started the excavation. The red is the scores after the excavation. I haven't included the middle scores because that's a whole other level. We can see from all of these results there was an increase in interest, connectivity, happiness and satisfaction. Of these, three are significant. And as we can see, connection, happiness and satisfaction increased. Statistically, they were significant increases. So the people engaged, involved and participating in the excavations, we could deem from these results were happier, improved their well-being during the course of this, the excavation projects. The positive negative effect schedule results, just the positive ones. It looks more painful, but the same applies. Orange is before, red is after. So we see increases, but we also saw some decreases. And those are worth noting, because we always assume that all the stuff we do makes people happier or is positive, but actually all the stuff archaeologists do and excavations do is not always positive. So we had an increase in, an obvious increase, in strength, pride and inspiration. But actually we saw decrease during the course of excavations from our community members in interest, excitement, enthusiasm and activity. Basically, they were a lot less enthusiastic at the end of the projects. But at least they felt stronger. So that's a positive, and I would hope they would after all that digging. Negative effects. Now this is where it starts to get very interesting. Probably not because you're looking at more boring graphs. But for someone like me who's become a bit of a, a geek over figures and proving things with them, they're quite useful. We saw irritability increase the most. But nervousness decreased the most. There were small rises in jittery upset, distress and hostility. And small decreases in guilt and being scared and being afraid. Um, most of these, because if you, if you looked at the previous graph, these changes in negative effects actually were very slight. Uh, statistically, most of them are kind of insignificant. But nervousness, so the decrease in nervousness was significant. But also, and the, the decrease in guilt was also significant. Um, but actually most of the negative uh, results were less significant on a positive. Um, so with a study of over 100 people, over a three-week, four-week period, depending on how long the excavation took. Because usually I chose excavation projects that had at least a three-week period, which is probably why you saw some of the negative scores happening as well. Um, it does suggest that being involved in excavation has a positive effect on well-being, and that many of the projects resulted in happier people. But it also had certainly some very interesting effects that were determined by social and environmental factors as well. So I'll talk to you a little bit more about 
how negative effects can come in when I go to the specific projects. Because in order to understand the project, you also need to look at a degree of qualitative evidence as well. As I suggested at the beginning, the PANAS surveys, the positive negative effects surveys, were harder. They were more complex, and actually uh, the changes were more varied and more problematic to determine. Actually, the modified visual analogue scale gave us the more, um, how can I put this, statistically significant, but actually more obvious results for improvement in well-being. Um, but what I want to do after all of this, and getting a gist of, you know, these excavations made people happier, is how they made people happier. More detail about what was involved and how then we drew and brought together projects that could increase well-being and happiness. What elements did we need? So we developed a project, uh, a well-being and educational project, within uh, Cambridgeshire, which involved seemingly not many, but 160 children were actually took part in the survey and we got results from, from primary and secondary students. Um, there are a range of different schools. Uh, we also were involved in a school with social, emotional and behavioural difficulties, a, sp a special school. Um, and this project was an excavation Anglo-Saxon site. So based on the findings from my earlier research, which suggested that community elements and engagement with archaeology could affect well-being, uh, we wanted to investigate whether actually you, you developed a project based on certain criteria, which I'll discuss in a bit, whether these wellbeing projects could really work. So we decided to scrap the children, the positive negative effects schedule survey, for obvious reasons. They would be too young to really have the emotional intelligence to understand how they felt on those scales. So we just did a happy and sad Lickard scale modified visual analogue scale with a broad range of students. Now, the results for this. Um, this project involved a range of activities. We took the children on museum visits. We took the children to festivals and we took the children to visit living museums and test pitting. The blunt reality is that the highest change in happiness during the course of this project was for test pitting. This had the biggest impact. Uh, the lowest score, the things that made people most unhappy, were visiting museums, sorry guys, um, and living history. So going to kind of heritage sites. And also just visiting an archaeological site. They found that very dull. They didn't make them happy and generally they, they didn't want to ever go back again. Sorry. We tried. So this begun to give us some examples of what maybe the key findings. So, key findings of all of this, all these bizarre surveys, was that involvement in physical activity was incredibly important. Involvement in excavation made people feel stronger and more active, but actually was key to happiness and well-being. Um, connectivity, so having community elements, having people more connected with the people around them, making friends, increased well-being. Satisfaction, feeling that you've found something, you've done something positive, that you've discovered something, making, having finds. So an excavation project that isn't just letting people dig a hole in the ground where there isn't anything. But an excavation project that involves them actually having a chance to find real archaeology. Makes people happier. And social dynamics. Well, that was key. It can also, it can, good social dynamics on a site can increase well-being. Bad social dynamics, friction between people, long residential projects, taking people away from their comfort zones, can decrease well-being, make people unhappier. So then a roadmap to success for community heritage projects in the future. So we've said that community heritage, community archaeology digging specifically can make people happier, given the right project and given the right, I suppose, incorporation of the right elements. Key to this is that your project is community-centred. 
that it is contextually specific, so it's designed organically to meet the community you're working with. It's demographically diverse. You're not just including your usual local amateurs, but you've got a range of people who come from different backgrounds. You provide freedom of choice. You're not forcing people to do things. They don't have to dig if they don't want to dig. You encourage ownership. Now, ownership for the children and for all of the adults was key. We meant, it got mentioned earlier on in the presentation about my. It's my site. It's mine. That is key. Ownership. Giving people the chance to feel it is theirs. But also that you're supporting learning, you're supporting knowledge production. They feel they're gaining something from that. And, as I mentioned before, that it has hands-on physical activities. You're not just taking people, showing something to them, and you're telling them they know everything. Thank you very much. Sorry, I was a bit rushed. <laughs>